All right, guys, so let's now talk about skin morphology, uh, primarily skin lesions, primary and secondary. So in dermatology, dermatologists like to focus on the basics, uh, specifically on the skin lesions, in which, as we know, a skin lesion basically means there is a pathological change in the skin. And the result of the pathological change in the skin, whether it's an infection or non-infectious cause, it will lead to a lesion. And this lesion can manifest in variety of different forms. Now, regarding skin lesions, um, they divide it into primary and secondary. Regarding primary, primary skin lesions meaning those that are unmodified. They are basically changes in the skin as it is. You know the origin, all right? Uh, for example, for example, you'll see a case of a vesicle especially in those people with uh, varicella zoster virus infection. You might see presence of vesicles and you'll know this is from varicella zoster virus. But let's say you have a skin lesion that had one form, one change, and it was modified to another. Like for example, in secondary skin lesions, we have a case of a crust. This crust did not come on its own. This crust was secondary to a ruptured vesicle. So maybe you had a vesicle, a fluid-filled sac in your skin, and it ruptured and it led to a crust. So this crust is secondary as a dried exudate is secondary to a ruptured vesicle, for example. Or an example of a secondary scar, of a secondary skin lesion is a scar, in which you could have a scar due to an injury. You maybe had an ulcer and eventually this ulcer was healed by a scar. So in the case of secondary lesion, there is modified changes. The skin lesion was modified to another form. But the primary skin lesions, they are as it is, they are unmodified, okay? Now, before we go to this video talking about the primary and the secondary skin lesions that we need to know as an example, uh, before that, we need to be able to describe a skin lesion. For example, I have one right here. This is a macula, for example. So we need to be able to describe this macula, uh, what is known as morphology. And in order to describe a skin lesion, we need to be organized. We need to be able to visually see the skin lesion. We need to be able to touch the skin lesion. And then from that point on, we can describe it based on our terms that we learn in dermatology. Instead of redness, you see erythematous, for example. Instead of a raised lesion, you'll see the appropriate term for it and vice versa, okay, or and so on. So in order to describe a skin lesion, you have to know three things in order. The first one is morphology. Morphology means you need to describe the skin lesion. You need to describe its shape and its size. And not just that, you need to be able to describe the S being the shape, the size, the color, C, B for the borders around the skin lesion, and T is the texture. You need to be able to describe everything about this lesion, especially the shape of it and the size of it. And when we talk about the shape of the lesion, uh, you don't have to necessarily just say, oh, it's round or oval in shape. No, you need to be able to tell whether it is lesion. Is it flat, like mine, this macula is flat? Is it flat? Is the lesion raised, for example? Or is it depressed, like in the case of ulcers, all right? So you need to be able by the shape. Is it round? Is it round? Is it, does it have a specific shape or not? And then you ask yourself, okay, is this lesion raised? flat or depressed, all right? And then from that point on, you ask yourself the size. For example, the size. Is it more than one centi, less than one centi? Is it large, is it small, and so forth. And then you ask yourself this lesion, all right? Let's talk about more specifically for this lesion, the shape. Let's go back to the shape. So I wanna ask a further question about this lesion. If this lesion is raised, is it filled with fluid or not? Does it have pus or not? Does it have fluid or not? Or is it not filled with fluid at all? So to summarize, when we describe the morphology first, the morphology of the skin, we want to think about the shape, the first S. And in the shape, we want to ask ourselves, is it round, oval, shaped, or whatever? Then second, we need to ask ourselves, is it raised? Is it flat? Is it depressed? And then third, if it's raised, is it filled with fluid? Is it filled with pus or not? And then we ask about the shape, about the size. This size, is it approximately huh, one to five millimeter, one to two centimeter, and so forth. Then you ask about the color. Is it erythematous? Is it pinkish? Is it reddish? So forth. Is it pale? With an erythematous patch or erythematous background, like a vesicle? 
And then you ask about the borders. Are the borders uh, symmetrical? Are they well-defined? Are they ill-defined? And so forth. And then you ask about the textures. The texture, like for example, scales. We can say that this legion, we can have a legion in case of psoriasis. In psoriasis, you have people that have plaques, and the texture of these plaques are scaly. You know, like a snake, essentially. They have a scaly like uh, it's texture. So you can describe the texture if applicable. And these are all included in the morphology. You ask about all of these things in order. You write these down and then you join them up in a sentence. You summarize all of your findings in a sentence with a morphology. So in order to describe a skin lesion, you have to go with the morphology first. And then you ask the, the shape, the size, the color, as well as the border and the texture. Then afterwards, you ask about configuration. Configuration means how is this lesion arranged or how are the lesions related to one another? You want to see, for example, are they joined up like this? Are these, every single one of these lesions are arranged, to one another, are, are arranged in one another in a circle? For example, for example, in case of a disease or a condition known as erysema multiform, not erysema nodiosum, erysema multiform, you can have what is known as target lesions. And target lesions, or iris, another word for it, can have basically plaques that are arranged in this manner. All right, they can be arranged in this circle. And they call this target lesions. Or in the case of people with varicella zoster virus infection or herpes zoster infection, they may present with what is basically vesicles, all right, in basically in their upper chest and extending towards basically the sides of your body where you can have a bunch of vesicles that are arranged in a zostiform manner, meaning that some of these vesicles in herpes zoster infection, they may occupy one dermatome or two dermatome in a linear pattern. So they may go towards this direction right here. So if you look at pictures of herpes zostiform, uh, virus infection, especially cases of shingles, you might see presence of vesicles arranged in this manner, uh, basically looking like looking like my hand. They're arranged in a, in a linear zostiform pattern or in a linear dermatoformer, dermatoformal pattern or zostiform pattern. It means they occupy one or more dermatotome per skin in a linear manner, like this path right here. Okay, so that's one example. Or other configuration, other configuration like grouped lesions, like people with herpes simplex viral infections, they could have basically vesicles arranged in groups. You could have this lesion coming up here, this lesion coming up grouped up here, and this one grouped up there. So you could have in a grouped manner. Or it could be linear, straight up like this, linear. You have a bunch of vesicles, for example, and they all are lined up in a linear pattern. So configuration you want to see. Are these skin lesions, are they grouped up in a specific pattern? like these or not. If they're not, you can say they are lined up in a undetermined pattern or in a, in, in a, in a general pattern. They're, you know, they don't have a specific name for it. You know, If you find a pattern that's not specific yeah, and it's general, you can't specify which pattern it is. You know, So this is what you mentioned in configuration, the arrangement of these lesions, like example one, two, three, and four by the blue color. Or if there's no configuration, you say this is a undetermined pattern, for example, okay? So this is for the configuration. Next, and the final thing is the distribution. Where are these skin lesions located? For example, in patients with erythema multiform, you might see these lesions, these target lesions in the, in the palm of your hand, arranged exactly like this arrangement, here, 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 and here, okay? So you might say it's found in the palm of your hand. Or in people with herpes zostiform infection or herpes zoster viral infection, it could be in the upper chest extending to the sides, for example. Or in cases with people with acne, it will be in the face mostly, for example. Or in the case of people with psoriasis, so psoriasis, uh, psoriasis, psoriasis or psoriasis, they might have a case of plaques with scaly texture on their knees, in both of their knees, and on the elbow. For example, so you have to, to mention in the description of a skin lesion, when you're, whenever you're describing a skin lesion, whether you're on the phone or you're writing it, you must determine the distribution. The distribution means the location of the lesion. Where in the body site is this lesion located? Is it in the hand? Is it in the knees? Is it in the part of the elbows, the face, and so forth? So to summarize, when you describe a skin lesion, you have to be systemic, basically. So you have to go in a systemic manner. So you have to describe the morphology with the SSCBT. 
and you have to include in your paragraph, in your description, the configuration. And then you include finally the distribution, which is the location of this lesion in a specific body site. For example, is it included in the back as well or not? Okay? So these are how you describe a skin lesion. And I will, uh, by the end of the video, I'll show uh, one example, one example of how you would describe a skin morphology. Uh, we will go through it together and you will appreciate the Annie. You'll appreciate the description of how to describe a skin lesion. Any skin lesion, because it's important, even if we're not going to be a dermatologist, it's important to be able to tell whether this is part of a skin disease or it's part of a systemic disease. Like if it was Crohn's disease, you might have erysema nodiosum. So you need to be able to determine that or not. All right, so now let's start with the skin lesion. Now that we appreciate that, now let's talk about the primary skin lesions as well as the secondary skin lesions, examples of them. Now regarding the primary skin lesions, the unmodified ones, we have numerous. And like we said before, whenever we have a think of a morphology, we need to think about is it raised, is it flat, or is it depressive? So let's talk about the flat ones. Let's talk about macule. So macule is a flat lesion. It is a flat lesion in which the size is less than one centi, and it always has a change in color. Look at mine, for instance. This one right here is a macula, and this macula has a change in color. Mine is brown, I have basically hyperpigmented compared to other regions, and I've had this for my entire life. So this macula is, is basically a flat primary skin lesion that's less than one centimeter with a change in color, okay? Of course, macula could be normal, like in my case, or it could be a sign of a fungal infection, such, such as tinea versicular. Tinea versicular is basically a fungal infection in which you can see multiple, multiple macules. You can see macules all over the chest, all, right, all over the sides of the chest, extending to the shoulder, and you can see it basically on part of your elbow as well. So this is another characteristic feature of a, uh, of infection that's characterized by macules. So it could be, in my case, normal, just one. I have had it since birth or it could be a case of fungal infection. Now, and this is of course, this is a macule, let's imagine this is my hand, for example, or my wrist. Now let's say we have a macule that's larger than one centi. It's the same thing, there's a change in color, let's say, there's a change in color, it's brown, and let's say it's flat, and this time it's larger than one centimeter. Then we call this patch. So a macule is the small brother, is the little brother, but the patch is the big brother. The only difference between the two is the size. So this one right here compared to this one, this is the patch, okay? And you can see patches in people with vitiligo, for example. They have white patches, especially throughout their hands, okay? Now we finish the flat lesions. Now let's talk about raised lesions, raised primary skin lesions, such as a papule. Now whenever we determine that a lesion is raised, like we said, if it's raised, then we need to know, does it contain fluid or not? Is it solid or not, for example? So we need to be able to determine whether this lesion is raised or not and what is its contents. And then we talk about the sides and so forth, okay? So regarding a papule, a papule is a raised skin lesion that is less than one centimeter. And it does not consist of fluid, all right? A papule is a papule, all right? And papules can be deposited within the epidermal layer or within the dermis layer. And there are many, many diseases that are characterized by papules. Uh, for example, we have a, a skin condition known as lichen planus. Lichen planus is characterized by papules, whether dermal or epidermal. Or a case of drugs. If somebody uses an antibiotic and or anti-epileptic, he might suffer from something known as drug eruptions. And they're also characterized by papules. Or a patient may suffer from warts, or penile warts, or any type of wart infection. And in that case, they might have a papule, infect, a papule feature. So in the case of papule, you'll see it basically raised, and it's going to be less than one centi, not consisting of fluid or pus or anything like that. But let's say this papule is more than one centimeter. Then we consider the name of the big brother, which is known as a plaque. A plaque is basically the same as papule, but it's more than one centimeter. And plaques are important because they are the characteristic feature of psoriasis. So if you ever see a patient uh, that you might suspect psoriasis, you might see in their knees, both of their knees, and let's say in their elbow, let's say, you might see, or in, the, in their back, you might see the presence of multiple plaques with a scaly texture with irregular borders, you know, and pinkish in color, let's say. So these are features you, you might see, especially in psoriasis, okay? 
Okay, now let's say, let's say we have a raised legion, more than one centimeter, but it is solid. It is very solid and it's deep, meaning this raised legion is basically its depth is greater than its diameter, you know, and you'll see uh, basically what looks like a nodule from within. And that's exactly what it is. If you have a raised legion more than one centimeter and it's solid and it's basically deep, deep, like let's say rheumatoid nodules, let's say, if you see that, this is what we call a nodule. Like in rheumatoid nodules, for example, these are considered nodules. You have a lesion that's basically deep within the dermal layer, okay? So these are raised primary skin lesions that are deep more than one centimeter. So let's say we have a raised skin lesion. Let's say it's less than one centi, for example, and it is filled with fluid. Do we call this a papule now? No, we can call this according to the content. If you have a raised lesion less than one centi and it is filled with, let's say, fluid or water, this is a vesicle, all right? This is definitely a vesicle. And a vesicle, you'll see it in chicken pox, and you'll see it in, again, herpes zoster viral infections, in a zosteriform pattern, or in a segmental pattern, or in a dermatomal pattern across the side of the chest, let's say unilateral side of the chest, okay? Unilateral. So this could be a vesicle, or if it's filled with sterile pus, sterile pus, meaning no bacterial organism, it is just filled with WBCs and it's fluid, then we call this a pustule. And in the case of a pustule, you'll see this especially in people with acne vulgaris, all right? Severe acne vulgaris, or in people with a specific type of psoriasis known as pustular psoriasis, for example, okay? So we need to know the difference between a vesicle and a pustule, all right? They're really both the same thing. The only difference both are raised lesions, both are less one centimeter. The difference is the content. If it's filled with a sterile pus, pustule. If it's filled with fluid only, vesicle. A vesicle is typically is pale in color with an erythematous patch in the background, yeah, okay? So let's say we have a raised lesion, all right? It's the same as a vesicle, let's say. We have a raised lesion filled with fluid, just like a vesicle, but it's more than one centimeter, or more than 0 0.5 centimeter. Then we call this as what? As a bulla. Okay, so it's known as a bulla, like bulla's uh, phenogoid. Uh, I forgot the name, sorry, but it's basically an autoimmune disease associated with epidermis uh, disorders. So we have a case of a bulla, for example, okay? So we need to know the difference between all of these two. These are all, up to this point, raised lesions. Papule, plaque, nodule, vesicle, bulla, postule. All of them are raised lesions. All of them differ from one another according to their size, according to their content, but they're all raised, okay? Next, and we still have more raised lesions to go, next is a very important one known as a wheel. Now, a wheel is a raised lesion that's characterized by a lesion that is red and very itchy, all right, and it comes and goes, meaning you might have a very itchy red spot all across your body, but after five to 10 minutes, it disappears. That's why they call the wheel transient lesion. It's basically a lesion that's characterized as transient. It comes and goes. It's very red, it's very itchy, and this is something that you will see as a passive mnemonic feature of urticaria. If you remember past videos, urticaria is basically a type one hypersensitivity reaction that involves the use of mast cells, which release histamine, okay? So we have a case of urticaria. Besides the urticaria, or besides the wheels, we have a case of cyst. A cyst, and you know what a cyst is. A cyst could be within the epidermal layer, or it could be within the dermal layer. And regarding a cyst, it is a raised soft sac. You'll see a raised lesion that's soft and filled with fluid, and it basically comes from the outside. You'll very, very easily tell a cyst from a vesicle. You'll be able to tell easily between the two. And you'll see this in cases of maybe pregnancy, or cases of skin diseases such as Rosiaca, it's basically a skin condition characterized by cysts and so forth, all right? So it's basically a very soft sac filled with fluid from within or from the outside, okay? So we have another case of a raised lesion. The last two is basically telangiectasia. Telangiectasia basically means dilated capillaries that resemble a spider web. And you'll see this in many, many diseases, maybe in people with immunodeficiency, uh, maybe in pa certain babies, congenital, and so forth. And the thing about telangiectasia, you want to differentiate telangiectasia, spider-like thing, 
uh, basically from ecchymosis or from purpura or from petechia. Here we have dilation of capillaries, but when you look at bleeding disorders associated with purpura or petechia or uh, ecchymosis, now here is a leakage of blood, all right? These involve leakage of blood to the outside, extravation or extravation of blood to the outside, and this gives the lesion known as ecchymosis, petechia, and purpura. The only difference between the three is petechia involves dot-shaped hemorrhages, while purpura and petechia, uh, purpura and ecchymosis are big ones. There are larger versions of petechia. And in the case of these bleeding disorders with petechia and purpura, as well as ecchymosis, when you, they're basically, uh, basically non-blanchable, meaning that if you were to press on one, if you were to press on a purpura, it will not disappear because the problem here is bleeding. But let's say we have a case of erysematous rash or a case of uh, not telegictasia, but we have a case of erysematous rash. When you press it, it actually disappears. When you let your hand go, it returns back. Because in case of erysematous rash or erysema, erysema is a sign of inflammation due to vasodilation, all right? That's blanchable. But in the case of non-blanchable, those pedicaceas, those ecchymoses, whatnot, no, these are non-blanchable. They are there regardless if you were to palpate it strongly. So back to the point with telegictasia. Telegictasia is the same thing. It involves dilation of capillaries, okay? It's there as it is, all right? And it has numerous, con numerous causes. The last one is Boro. Now, Boro is another race lesion that is associated with scabies. Scabies tend to be have boros, especially around the wrist. This is not just the only specific site for scabies. Scabies, uh, this site around the wrist can be also a site of contact dermatitis, for example, uh, for example. So there's a number, number, number of numerous conditions associated with a skin lesion around the wrist, but a burrow can be represented by here and involved in the form of scabies, okay? So these are all the raised lesions. Whenever you look at a picture, remember, go by the steps, go by the morphology, then the configuration, then the distribution, and then you'll be able to determine what are these exactly, how, what is their pattern, what is the MECQ, what is its pattern, and what is the distribution? Where are they located exactly, okay? So these are the primary skin lesions. Then you go to the, none other than the secondary skin lesions, okay? Now regarding the secondary skin lesions, these are the modified ones. So for example, we have a case of a crust. We already talked about crust from before. They're basically dried exudates. Exudates, uh, basically fluid filled sac like a vesicle that ruptured and now you have an exudate that's dried up and become very crusty. So we have a case of a crust. Besides a crust, we have something known as excoriation. Excoriation basically means when a person constantly scratches and scratches and scratches and scratches, he'll leave a linear mark on his skin. And that linear mark can be hemorrhagic. So that's the meaning of excoriation. There's basically a linear scratch or damage through the skin superficially as a result of constant scratching. All right, so you have a case of excoriation. And something to differentiate excoriation from another lesion is liquefication. Now, liquefication, this, this doesn't come from scratching, just scratching halals, no. This comes from chronic severe itching. If you have a constant itch and you constantly itch, 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 itch in a severely manner for a long period of time, then in that case, you have what is known as liquefication. You'll have a very, very visible linear mark around the skin as a result of your constant scratching. Besides liquefication, we have a scar, and the thing about scars, they're kind of not a good thing because scars, especially in the skin, basically can mean one thing. It can mean loss of structure in that area. It can also mean loss of function, meaning no hair follicles, no sweat in that region. So when we think of a scar, you're afraid of basically there's loss of function and structure in that area because scar involves healing by fibrosis. Basically, there's no complete healing. There is healing only in the form of fibrosis, a result of a wound that might have penetrated deep in the dermis. So that's not necessarily a good thing. And you might see this in cases of people with alopecia, where they might have a scar all around their scalp, and basically the hair follicles is not gonna be able to grow in that area anymore. So as a result, you'll have a case of alopecia. So scars are not necessarily a good thing. And of course, there are many types. There's keloid as an example of it, but that's for another video. Then you talk about scales. We're talking about scales, and scales are not necessarily found just in cirrhosis, where they're seen as a thick silver scale. Look up any picture of cirrhosis. You'll see the presence of plaques with a scaly silver, basically a plaque with a silver scaly appearance and thick 
and cirrhosis. If you look up any picture, you'll find basically matching the description. But scales are not necessarily the only thing that's going to be exclusive to cirrhosis. You can also find scales that are fine, very fine, fine like scales in the form of eczema. So in people with eczema, you might find scales that are thin or fine, unlike the thick ones you might see in cirrhosis. So that's another example of secondary lesions. Then besides the scale, you have erosion and ulcer. What is the difference between erosion and ulcer? Erosion involves a breakage in the epithelium. You break the epithelium, but not completely. So there's no complete thickness loss or complete loss of epithelium thickness-wise that can lead to a scar, all right? So in the case of erosion, bits and pieces of the epithelium of the skin is lost, but not completely penetration, all right? But in the case of an ulcer, no. In an ulcer, you have complete penetration of the skin epithelium, all right? And that will eventually lead to healing by a scar. Typically in erosion, there's no healing by a scar. But in the ulcer, as a result of complete, complete deep penetration of the skin, complete loss of the thickness of the epithelium as a result of deep penetration all the way throughout, it will lead to healing for, by a scar. And ulcers, there are many causes of ulcers, many. And these, by the way, when you combine erosion and ulcer, as well as atrophy together, skin atrophy, meaning atrophy of the skin, like for example, due to use of topical steroids for a long period of time, that inhibits skin growth. Whenever you have skin atrophy, which is another example of secondary skin lesion, and erosion and ulcers, these are all examples of depressive lesions, lesions that basically are depressive below. They go inside, they're the opposite of raised skin lesions, okay? They're not flat, they're not raised, they are depressive, okay? Besides that, you have other examples of secondary skin lesions, such as a fissure. A fissure can involve a linear crack, so you can have a linear crack in your skin, and that is considered as a fissure. And then you have sclerosis, which basically means hardening of the skin. Like people with scleroderma, they might have very hardening of the skin, and as a result, they basically have a form of sclerosis. Uh, you don't want to basically uh, confuse sclerosis with liquidification. If you see a picture of liquidification, you might think this is sclerosis. No, uh, liquidification with severe itching, uh, basically the skin will basically thicken. You'll have thickening of the skin, and there will be basically over exaggeration of the skin creases, the creases in your elbows, that is. So it will look like a lizard scale, but it's not exactly sclerosis. All right, so don't confuse between the two. Look at multiple pictures between the two to appreciate the difference, okay? The last thing is necrosis. Necrosis means loss of the tissue. And of course, necrosis is typically characterized by blackish colored tissue. Typically, when it's necro necrotic, then at that point, the, the, the tissue is dead. The tissue is completely dead, especially in the skin. You'll see this, especially in people with uh, necrotizing fasciitis. So you'll see a blackish colored tissue, and you can immediately tell, okay, I'm afraid this is gangrene, and I'm afraid this is a case of severe necrosis to the tissue, okay? So these are all examples of secondary skin lesions that you might find uh, on examination, whether on the clinic as a dermatologist or a non-dermatologist, resident, intern, whatever. Like for mine, you can easily describe this as a case of a macula with abnormal amount of hair protruding out of it, but it's not serious, all right? This is a case I've had since birth. So the purpose of the video is you go through skin lesions in a systemic manner. How will you describe it? You describe it in morphology, configuration, and in distribution. And then you look at all of these as examples. Know the difference between each of these, especially in the primary skin lesions and the secondary skin lesions, so that when you look at a picture of a possible skin lesion, you can able to describe it properly in a systematic manner, all right? Whether you're only gonna be on the call with a doctor or you're gonna be typing it on the computer to a doctor about what this patient might have. So that both you and the other doctor, you and the other colleague, both are on the same page and you both could tell, okay, what could be the likely diagnosis from this skin lesion or what might be the possible cause, okay? All right, that's pretty much it for the skin morphology and I'm gonna end this video with an example of a skin lesion and how to describe it. Thank you.